Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Gavin. Thank you very much for being here. Today we're talking about a case that is probably the nightmare scenario for any parent. Kimberly and I have five children ranging from 21 years old to seven years old. I've definitely had nightmares where something like this happened. Thankfully in the real world, our children are all safe but it's terrifying to know that for many families, they aren't so fortunate. They have terrible things happen to their children. And it doesn't seem to matter if your child is a grown adult or still little. If something happens to your child, it's a nightmare. And in some cases, it's even worse because not only do terrible things happen, but some parents never find out what it was that actually happened. And in the case we're talking about today, that's the nightmare that two parents lived for 13 years. They knew that something happened to their 17-year-old daughter, but what happened to her remained a mystery until earlier this month. But before we get too far into the story, I want to remind you that I'll be at CrimeCon UK on June 11th and 12th in London at the Leonardo Royal Hotel and Spa near St. Paul's Cathedral. As I've told you before, this is going to be my very first time at CrimeCon. When I first started talking to the folks at the show, I was either looking at Las Vegas or London, and I'm really glad I chose the London show because it's one of my very favorite places to visit. And I know that several of you that are watching this video right now are in the UK, so I'm hoping to get to meet you in person. If you've been to CrimeCon before, you know that it's a weekend that is just jam-packed with exhibits, demonstrations, speakers, and lots of fun things to do. Podcast Row, which is where I'll be, is full of your favorite YouTubers and podcasters. I've been getting to know a few of them over email for the past couple of months, and this will be my first time meeting them in person. I'm really looking forward to it. Please join me there and use code GAVIN for 10% off admission. And if you're a patron of mine, you actually get 15% off. All you have to do is DM me inside Patreon and I'll get you the hookup. For more information, visit crimecon.co.uk. And thank you, CrimeCon UK, for providing that discount to my viewers and my patrons. I can't wait to go, and I can't wait to see some of you there. Okay, if you've read the title of the video, you know that the subject today is the case of Brittany Drexel. Brittany was a 17-year-old high school student living in Chile, New York. Chile is a small community of a little less than 30,000 people that sits about 12 miles to the southwest of Rochester in upstate New York. She was raised by her parents, Don and Chad, and from everything that I can tell, Brittany was an average American kid who had a little bit of adventure in her. Like many teenagers, she probably thought the world was her oyster. And like many teens, I don't think she really knew how dangerous the world can be. And I'm not saying that the world is a bad place at all. In fact, as I've traveled around, and I'm Johnny Cash over here, I mean, I've been everywhere, including living and visiting overseas, even when I was a teenager and in my early 20s. I have found most people in the world to be far, far from the boogeyman that my parents and grandparents told me would pull up in a van and take me away forever. But I don't think it's a bad idea to instill in our children that the world and some of the people in it can be dangerous. In fact, I think most parents do that by instinct and over time, we give our kids more and more freedom to spread their wings so that when the time is right, they're able to fly. And while I don't know Don and Chad Drexel, I have faith that that's the way they were raising a teenage daughter 
who just wanted to fly. The reason that I say that is because according to reports, Brittany asked her folks if she could travel from the Rochester area down to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina with her friends over spring break in 2009. Her mom did not give her permission to do that because number one, she didn't know who was going. Number two, there weren't any adult uh, chaperones going with them. And number three, she felt like something was going to happen to her daughter. It just didn't sound like all that great of a plan now, did it? So yeah, she said no, like any sane parent would to their 17 year old daughter who is asking permission to travel six states, 800 miles away. No young lady, just no would be the same answer. Brittany, apparently, she didn't like that answer. And even as I tell you this story, the teenager inside of me is just clawing to get out and enumerate all the reasons why my mom just isn't being fair. And I can hear my mom say, life isn't fair. And that doesn't help. The, the frustration of my teenage self right now is welling up inside me and I'm ready to just have a complete absolute come apart at the injustice, the malevolence of my cruel and spiteful mother, the mother who gave me life, but then doesn't want me to live it on my own terms. She just wants to restrain me and regulate my every move with, with domineering manipulation that could only spawn from the controlling subjugating overlord that she is. It's just wrong. That's what my teenage self says before I storm away and I slam my bedroom door having lost yet another battle to the Chairman Mao that is my mother. I wonder if Brittany was anything like me when she heard the news from her mom that she couldn't go to Myrtle Beach. I think probably so. But I think Brittany channeled her feelings and came up with a plan over the next couple of days. Her plan was simple. Step one, be argumentative. This would make her parents not want her around. They'd be a little more pliable. Step two, once her parents were primed, she could ask if she could go to a friend's house for a day or two to cool off. By this time, her parents were probably looking for a way out and they agreed that she could. So Brittany left her parents' house to go stay with her friend who lived nearby, but that's not actually where she went. On April 22nd, 2009, Brittany and two friends, 18-year-old Alana Lippa and 20-year-old Jennifer Oberer, traveled to Myrtle Beach. It was about a 12 and a half hour drive. I'm sure she thought, if they find out I'm in South Carolina, at least I can have a good spring break with my friends and then I'll take the consequences when I get home. I mean, that's what I'd think at that age. So... Off to South Carolina she went with her friends. I figure the 22nd was spent driving Interstate 95 from Rochester to Myrtle Beach. We don't know much about where she was on the 23rd, but we do know on the 24th, which was a Friday, she was at a nightclub called Club Kryptonite where she met up with a friend from Rochester, a nightclub promoter named Peter Brozowitz who was also there in Myrtle Beach during spring break. Along with Brozowitz, she met another man, Anthony Schmizzy, another man, Philip Watson, another Keith Cummings, and another Matthew Abrams. These men were sharing a hotel room with Brozowitz at a place called the Blue Water Resort. 
The following morning at about 11, Brittany met up with the, with the same men on the beach for a short time. Also that day, the three girls who had traveled together checked in at the Bar Harbor Hotel in, in Myrtle Beach. Now, like a good daughter, Brittany had been calling her mom to check in. That day, she told her mom she was going down to the beach. And while that might sound funny, Dawn just thought that she meant she was going to a nearby beach on Lake Ontario. It was unseasonably warm, 83 degrees Fahrenheit that day. It didn't seem out of the ordinary to her mom at the time. The last thing that Brittany said to Dawn was, Mom, I'll see you tomorrow. I love you. This whole time, the time that she was away, Brittany had been texting her boyfriend back in Rochester. He was in on it. He knew where she was and what she was up to. At about 8 o'clock the night of the 25th of April, Brittany had left her hotel alone to walk about a mile and a half to visit Brozowitz and the other men at the Blue Water Resort. In a police report, it said Schmizzy, Watson, Cummings, and Abrams said that she came to their room at about 8 o'clock, but was only there for about 10 minutes. Apparently, she had been arguing with Jennifer Oberer. I imagine that this was done over the phone. Oberer was angry that Brittany was wearing her shorts and wanted them back. So she left to return the shorts. Security cameras showed her arriving and then leaving at about 8.45 p.m. At 8.58 p.m., less than 15 minutes after leaving the Blue Water Resort, texts from Brittany to her boyfriend just stopped. Just all of a sudden, just stopped. And her boyfriend, a kid named John Greco, got pretty worried. He started reaching out to the group of friends who he knew were down in Myrtle Beach with Brittany to see if anything was wrong. When he wasn't able to figure out where his girlfriend was, he called Dawn and told her everything how Brittany wasn't at her friend's house, how she wasn't at a beach at Lake Ontario, how she was in South Carolina, and now how she seemed to be missing. And this all happened within just a few minutes. So I have to say, good for that kid. Good for him for jumping into action. If something like this were to happen to my child, which I hope, I, I just hope would never happen. Uh, I, I wouldn't hope that on anyone, but I, I hope if something happened to my child, her boyfriend would behave the same way at this point. So Don and Chad, they leapt into action once they found out what was really going on. The first call they made was actually to the Rochester Police Department. They had hoped that by doing that, the Rochester PD would call down to their counterparts in Myrtle Beach and they would have a better chance that police down there would take uh, Brittany's disappearance more seriously. Good plan. Meanwhile, they continued to call and text Brittany. She didn't respond to anyone. And I don't know this for sure, but I think they either got a warrant to track her phone or maybe her parents gave them permission as the owners of the account. I don't know. Either way, at 9.27 p.m., Brittany's cell phone pinged and investigators saw that it was in Surfside Beach, which is about six miles from the Blue Water Resort to the south. Reports then say that the phone pinged about 46 miles south of the Blue Water Resort at 11.58 p.m. the night of April 25th. That was its final ping. The following day, which would be Sunday, April 26th, 2009, Dawn arrived in Myrtle Beach to look for her daughter. The same day, Myrtle Beach police 
visited the hotel room where Brittany was staying. That report is timestamped at 7.02 p.m., but I think the visit was earlier than that, but that's when the report was created. The police learned everything that I just shared with you during that visit. At that time, they searched Brittany's things in her hotel room and found all the clothes she had uh, packed were there. The two items that were missing were only her purse and her cell phone. Okay, so just to kind of wrap our heads around this for a second, on the 24th, which was Friday, she was at the nightclub with Brozowitz and his friends or the men sharing his hotel room. On the 25th, she was on the beach in the morning with Brozowitz's friends and in the hotel room that night at about 8 p.m. She was last seen by security cameras at about 8.45 p.m. She stopped texting her boyfriend Grico at about 9 p.m. and her phone stopped pinging at just before midnight. And I have to say that I'm actually pretty impressed with the Myrtle Beach Police Department. From what I've read in their reports, they took this case seriously. Um, the images of Brittany entering and then exiting the Blue Water result, or Resort were obtained by police the morning of the 26th. If they were contacted shortly after 9 p.m. on the 25th and they were already looking for her the morning of the 26th, I'd say they're taking it seriously. There's so many cases I've looked at where the police won't even consider anyone missing unless they've been gone for more than 24 hours. So kudos to them. I suspect, sadly, they're well-practiced in young kids going missing during spring break. That's actually probably a pretty sad reality for them. The next thing that happens in this case, from what I can tell, is a huge search involving about 50 police officers and canines searching a, a boat landing near where Brittany's phone last pinged. That search happened on May 3rd, 2009, eight days after she went missing. They didn't find anything. So days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and months turned into years. During this whole time, as the case got colder and colder, there were still efforts uh, that were being made to find Brittany Drexel. Dawn, her mom, actually relocated to Myrtle Beach, and billboard, billboards were run all over the area. Flyers were passed out. Volunteer searches were made. But it just didn't seem to matter what they did. They just could not find Brittany Drexel. Seven years later, there appeared to be a break in the case in a weird way. Back in 2012, a man named Timothy Taylor, so this is three years after Brittany goes missing, but four years before this came to light. That I guess that's what I mean by back in 2012. So this guy named Timothy Taylor, he participated in a crime. Let's just say it was involving taking money that was in the tills and safe of an area fast food restaurant. Let's just call it that. Taylor was the getaway driver. So in June of 2016, the FBI held a press conference in which they stated that they believed that Brittany Drexel's life had been taken shortly after she disappeared. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Dave Thomas, I'm a special agent in charge for the FBI here in South Carolina. And I echo the comments. I appreciate the family being here, the media being here. And the FBI has been involved in this investigation with our closest partners, Mark Keel with SLED, Sheriff of Berkeley County, Charleston County, Warren Gall, Myrtle Beach asked us early on to help and see if the FBI had any resources in this investigation. And the agents and the investigators have worked tirelessly from day one on this investigation. What we've come to 
discovered through the course of the investigation now is that Brittany Drexel did leave the Myrtle Beach area. We believe she traveled to this area around McClellanville and uh, the North Charleston, South Georgetown area, and we believe she was killed after that. We're here today seeking the help from the public, from you, the media, and helping us get the word out about that. We know this is a great community. We know there's great people here. We know there's people that saw something, heard something, that has information that could lead us to closing out this investigation and bringing closure to this family who's dealt with this awful tragedy. And any time you work an investigation like this, they're extremely difficult. And we understand, and I said we've looked at thousands of leads so far, but there's still information that we need. I've been authorized by the director of the FBI to offer a $25,000 reward leading to the arrest and the conviction of those responsible for killing Brittany Drexel. And, uh, that, and so again, after this, we urge anyone with information, no matter how insignificant you think it is, no matter how small, if you think we already have that information, to please call in to the tip lines and let us know, because that information may be that one significant piece is all it will take to push us over the edge on this. Again, we're appealing to the community of good people here because we know there's tremendously good people in this community and we know that people have heard something or seen something and they may not even know how significant that information is. And also, I will say that in other high profile investigations that we've done in this state, that the FBI has charged people that we found that new information and didn't come forward. And I won't hesitate to ask the U.S. Attorney's Office to do that again in this investigation. I would like to think that people would come forward on their own, but we do know that there are people here that understand and know what happened. And during the course of our interviews, if we find out that people do know what happened, they do know what happened to Brittany Drexel and they didn't come forward, I won't hesitate to ask U.S. Attorney's Office to charge those people also. They said that she had been snatched from Myrtle Beach and was taken to somewhere in the vicinity of Georgetown, South Carolina. Georgetown is basically the area where her phone last pinged. And in their press conference, they put up a $25,000 reward for information that would close the case. At that time, they did not say why they believed what they did at the time. But two months later, there was a bond hearing for Timothy Taylor, the getaway driver. Timothy had already served time for his part in the heist back in 2012, but now the FBI was trying to prosecute him for the exact same crime, this time in federal court rather than in state court. This, by the way, was a major case that had constitutional ramifications. In the U.S., one cannot be tried for a crime for which they've already been convicted. That is something that is called double jeopardy. And double jeopardy was so important to our founders that they included it in a clause in the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Quote, no person shall be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. Close quote. This was an abuse that the American colonies suffered under Great Britain, and they weren't going to have any of it in their new republic. So why was Timothy Taylor being put under federal indictment on federal charges for a crime that he was already convicted of? Well, that's actually an interesting story. At Timothy Taylor's bond hearing, an FBI agent testified in open court that another man named Taquan Brown, a man who at the time was serving a 25-year sentence for another crime, this one was violent, he told them back in 2009, shortly before Brittany's disappearance, that he had gone to a stash house to give money to Timothy Taylor's dad. His story goes, as he went inside, he saw Brittany being, let's call it SA'd by Timothy Taylor in the company of others. His story continues 
that he went through the house into the backyard where he made his payment to Timothy Taylor's dad. He then saw Brittany running away from the house, but saw that she was caught. He then heard the report of two shots and assumed that that was the end of Brittany Drexel. He claims that he then saw them remove her from the house, wrapped up in like a rug, and then that was thrown into one of the many alligator ponds nearby. And let's just pause for a second. And those of us who do not live in alligator country, let's just express gratitude that there are not alligator ponds all over the place. But okay, here in South, there in South Carolina, there were. All right. Apparently... This story was corroborated by another witness, so the FBI took it seriously. And all of the testimony in this hearing, by the way, is, I mean, it's, it's on the internet. I've read it. It's 46 pages long. Now, it turns out that we find out later in 2022 that none of this happened to Brittany Drexel. So, either Brown and the other witness were just telling stories, or it really did happen, just not to Brittany. And that, that is a scary thought. And before I get back to the rest of the story, let me just finish out this tangent by telling you about the whole double jeopardy thing, okay? Um, while all this was happening, and I'm leaving out a lot of details here because they're really not relevant to the case we're talking about, to Brittany Drexel's case, but there was a case before the U.S. Supreme Court called Gamble v. United States that challenged what is called dual sovereignty or separate sovereignty, uh, so sovereignty doctrine. Man, I have a hard time with that word. All right, so the uh, dual sovereignty or the separate sovereignty doctrine is what Gamble v. United States was, was challenging. The argument is that the double jeopardy clause of the Fifth Amendment doesn't generally protect a person from being po uh, prosecuted by separate sovereignties. So this is what the government was arguing. Because the federal government and the state governments are distinct from one another, each one of them can bring charges against a person for the same crime as long as they have jurisdiction. So, for example, if Kimberly and I go on a rampage in California and then we run to Nevada there are three sovereigns that might claim jurisdiction. California, because that is where we would have committed the crime. Nevada, because that is where we ran to. And the federal government, because during the course of our crimes, we crossed state lines. That's not a perfect analogy, but you guys get it. Anyway, while Gamble versus the United States was making it its way through the Supreme Court, proceedings against this guy, Timothy Taylor, were put on hold. Eventually, the Supreme Court came down on the side of dual sovereignty. So Taylor pleaded guilty and was sentenced to time served, which was something like 319 days. But the reason I bring all this up is that it appears that the that everything the FBI did it appears that that was done for the purpose of putting the squeeze on Taylor into admitting that he was the guilty party in the Brittany Drexel case. But through all of that, which I'm sure there were, there was just so much pressure. He never caved Brown, by the way, who is the guy who told the FBI about Taylor later told reporters that he saw Brittany on four different occasions, two of which at least to, to my reading of it, happened after the time he said that he saw her at Timothy Taylor's dad's house wrapped up and thrown into a pond full of alligators. So, yeah, I, I think that was just a three-year-long ride that somebody with mental health issues took the FBI on. Unfortunately, 
I think it derailed all the efforts that the FBI was making in looking for Brittany Drexel. I think it was just a big distraction. Okay, another few years pass, and I know that we're going over this quickly, but those would have been agonizing, painful, slow years for Brittany Drexel's family. So those years pass, and then about a week ago, uh, from the time that I'm recording this, on May 16th, the Georgetown County Sheriff's Office and the Drexel family made an announcement that there had been an arrest in the case of Brittany Drexel. The purpose of this press conference is to address recent law enforcement activity within Georgetown County as it pertains to the disappearance of Brittany Drexel. Brittany's mother, Dawn, and Chad, and Father John were promised that every resource would be used to find the answer of what happened to Brittany, where did it happen, how did it happen, and why did it happen. The why may never be known or understood, but today this task force can confidently and without hesitation answer the rest of those questions along with the who is responsible. The who is Raymond Douglas Moody, who lives at 5502 Rose Hill Road in Georgetown, South Carolina. His date of birth is May the 9th of 1960, and he is a white male with an extensive criminal history. The Georgetown County Sheriff's Office charges against Mr. Raymond Moody occurring within the jurisdictional limits of Georgetown County all of which occurred on April the 25th of 2009, and all of which detail Brittany Drexel as the victim. Charges against Raymond Moody were made possible through investigative findings and evidence that led us to a possible site where Raymond Moody buried a deceased Brittany Drexel on or about April the 26th of 2009. Coroner Ridgeway, along with the Charleston County Coroner's Office, positively identified through dental records the remains we found were indeed Brittany Drexel. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division also performed DNA analysis and corroborated the coroner's findings. This has been an exhaustive case that has generated co cooperation from the public and the media over the past 13 years. We all thank you for that. To the Drexel family, we mourn with you and pray for you as you cope with the tragedies of 13 years ago. No one deserves to go through this, and our hearts go out to you. Our only hope is that this finding allows your family to grieve properly for Brittany. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I want to take this opportunity to thank the FBI, all the law enforcement agencies that worked on her case, the solicitor's office, and all the investigators who never gave up on the search for Brittany and the individuals responsible for ta from taking her from us. I want to thank those of you in the media that kept Brittany's story current and didn't forget about her or our family. I want to thank the many volunteers that helped search for Brittany and answers with us. You have all inspired me and the investigators to keep going. I am comforted by everyone who has been a part of our lives and those we have met along the way. This is truly a mother's worst nightmare. I am mourning my beautiful daughter, Brittany, as I have been for 13 years. But today, it's bittersweet. We are much closer to the closure and the peace that we have been desperately hoping for. I am slowly processing everything that has come to light. I have not hidden from commenting or discussing Brittany's case publicly. We do not plan on speaking or answering any questions today. I do ask that you respect our family's privacy and allow us to grieve during this time. We do not intend to, or we do intend to speak at some point. 
Today marks the beginning of a new chapter. The search for Brittany is now a pursuit of Brittany's justice. It is bittersweet. And we have a little more closure than what we wanted. Weighing this all out is tough on a dad, tough on a mother. But having faith and hope is what's going to guide us through the end result because they still have the work to do and we have full. I, I cooperate. I mean, every the support that I can give them is not even near what I want to give them. So thank you guys. Thank you very much. From what I can tell, and reports vary on this, but from what I can nail down, about two weeks prior to that, on May the 4th, 2022, there was a man who in the past had been named a person of interest in this case as far back as 2011, 2012, for reasons that haven't been made public. But those reasons might just be that police knew he was living in Georgetown at the time, and he was known to them for acts that he did on someone or some people who were young back in 1983 in California. Maybe that's why they knew him. He was a person of interest, a guy named Raymond Moody. He turned himself into the sheriff's office on a charge of obstruction of justice. And... Honestly, that's all I know about that charge. I think as time passes and a case is brought against him, we'll likely learn more about why he came in and did that. But according to the sheriff's office, Moody confessed to the crime and told them where Brittany's remains could be found. According to the arrest warrant, Moody was charged with three things. Number one, obstructing justice. Number two, causing the life of Brittany Drexel to be no more. The method he used is on the warrant. It's very low resolution, but I think you can kind of make it out right there. Third, un unlawfully seizing or confining Brittany Drexel and lower down on the, on the arrest warrant, you can see what that means. So on May 11th, law enforcement uh, going to the place that Moody told them, they found human remains buried four feet into the ground off of a gated private drive outside of Georgetown, South Carolina. The remains were identified as Brittany Drexel's through DNA and dental matching. According to the arrest warrant, Brittany Drexel's life ended on April 26th, 2009, the day after she disappeared. I think it's likely, likely that it happened just a few hours after her disappearance. Yeah. So I want to talk for just a few minutes about what we can learn from this case. I want to be careful here and make it clear that I'm not blaming Brittany at all for what happened here. I'm also not blaming her parents. I'm not blaming her friends, her boyfriend, the men that she met at the nightclub. I'm not blaming any of them. The blame here falls squarely on the shoulders of the person who took her life. Of course, in this country, we presume innocence until proven guilty. So Raymond Moody is given that benefit. But let's talk about what we can learn for a minute. I've shared on this channel and on the Solve Crimes with Rick and Gavin uh, channel. Now it's called Solve Crimes TV. I've talked about it with my former partner, Rick Tracewell, on that channel, how uh, I look at this sort of thing. And I think it bears repeating. As I said before, Kimberly and I have five children, and we've taught our children from the time that they were little that the road, you know, the street is a dangerous place. And so they were never to walk or play in the street. And it's funny just how little kids don't, they don't recognize what, what that danger is, right? Now, if they're 
say they're in the yard and they're playing with a ball and it accidentally goes into the street and one of our children chases after that ball and are subsequently hit by a car, whose fault is it? Well, it's the driver's fault. That person, while driving through the neighborhood, has the responsibility to be on the lookout for anyone who might be in the street. But does the child who ran into the street and got hit have any responsibility? I think that the answer is yes. They don't have the fault, but they do have some responsibility. If you've watched most of the videos on my channel, you'll see a long series about the case of Amanda Winkowski. If you haven't watched those, please go and watch them. But in those cases, in my research about that case, I talked with a retired detective who was a friend of Amanda's family. And he used a phrase that I'll never forget. And that phrase was high risk person. In life, there are things that we do and decisions that we make that put us in a position of either high or low risk for the consequences of the actions and decisions that we make. In Amanda's case, I think she grew up too quickly. She fell in with the wrong crowd and she became addicted to drugs. This led her to do very risky things in order to feed that habit, that addiction. And she knew that she had a problem and was trying her best to address it with the help of her family and with some of her friends. But she was a high risk person because through a series of decisions, she found herself in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the nation, knocking on the door of a very dangerous person. And that was the last time that she was seen alive. If you look at, at my video on the case of Shelby Thornburg, we see a similar pattern. A young woman making one bad decision after another, and again, I'm not blaming her when you don't have good choices in front of you. It's hard to make good decisions, right? But one step at a time, she led herself or let somebody else lead her. It's a better way to say that down a path that led to the ending of her days on earth. She was extremely high risk. And even if we look at a case that I've been working on recently, the Ellen Greenberg case, who on the surface was not a high risk person. I mean, she, she was an elementary school teacher. Doesn't scream high risk, right? And, and she came from a nuclear family that loved and cared for her, but she did have a secret, a secret that nobody knew about until after she was gone and that secret was she was in an abusive relationship. At least that's what I think evidenced by all the bruises all over her body. And the more she struggled to get herself out, the more dangerous it got for her. Again, this is all my opinion. So let's get back to Brittany. In my view, she was an adventurous young lady who wanted so badly to act like a grown up. Which, I mean, it's ironic to me that she was acting like a grown-up by going to a giant annual drunken party in South Carolina. And I think from the fact that she talked to her mom about getting permission to go shows that she had a good, uh, solid relationship with her parents. But she made a decision to sneak away, 800 miles away. And when she got into that situation, starting at somewhere around 8.58 p.m. on the night of April 25th, 2009, she didn't have the tools to get away. So what can we learn from this? Going back to that question, how do we teach our kids about the dangers of the world without instilling in them a deep fear for what is actually quite a beautiful place. 
Well, somehow we need to teach our kids to understand that in this world, there are predators. They're a small fraction of society, but they're there. And each one of us has an instinct that tells us when something is not quite right, when a predator is hunting. This is usually known as the flight or flight, uh, fight or flight response. And we somehow need to make it so our kids can trust that response and prepare for a time when they'll need it. So I was thinking about, I don't want to put Kimberly and I up on a pedestal as if we're the world's greatest parents, because as your kids get older, you understand just how little control you have, right? But I was thinking about this in our case, we, we did something which I think in hindsight was a good choice. When they were little, uh, and it started out with just our son, but uh, we eventually enrolled all of us, including Kimberly and I, we studied martial arts together. And we did it for years. During our martial arts training, I was surprised to learn that as we studied the art of fighting, that was actually secondary in our training to the to the art of avoiding the fight altogether. What we learned and practiced in each class really honed our fight or flight response. And to this day, I'm hypersensitive to perceived danger. I, I'm not neurotic about it. I'm just always on the lookout. I highly recommend that you take your kids to some kind of martial arts training with a teacher, mentor, sensei, sifu, master, instructor, whatever, who will focus on recognizing danger and avoiding it. I read a quote on the internet that is attributed to Albert Einstein. Uh, I don't know if, it, if he really said it, but the quote is, quote, the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. So I don't know if he actually said that or not, but the quote rings true. And I have to admit that there have been several times in my life when I've been guilty of doing nothing when I definitely should have done something. I think we can all relate to that. Uh, fear keeps us from acting sometimes. Other times it's not wanting to be rude that keeps us from acting. But whatever it is that makes each of us decide not to act when we witness something and we know we really should, we need to train that out of us. And at the risk of turning this video into a pitch for karate or taekwondo or kung fu or jujitsu lessons, let me just say that martial arts training can take that out of you. So again, please take yourself and your kids and find a good martial arts school. I think that that's what I'm taking out of out of this case. That's the lesson that I think that I have learned. The Drexel family described the events of this month as bittersweet. I'm happy for them that they now know what happened to Brittany and by whom. And I hope this will bring them a little peace. I don't think it will bring them closure because I honestly think that's impossible. But if it does, I'm happy for them. And with that, I will bid you adieu. I hope to see you next time. Take care. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to my channel. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below.